Welcome to the Tech.MN podcast, a Made in Minnesota podcast featuring the stories of individuals that make up the tech capital of the North. And here's your host, Kevin McArdle. Thank you very much, Jack Stark. How are you doing? You know, Kevin, it's a special week. I'm celebrating one year at Tech.MN this week. I know. Happy anniversary. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Um, our guest today actually just kicked off his new role. We have Sam Nadelli. Um, before we talk about that, how about we just jump right into it? Sam, do you want to tell us a little bit about your life and what brought you to where you are today? Yeah. Um, so what was it? A week or two weeks ago, I celebrated my 31st birthday. So um, I'm a Gemini baby. Summer Happy baby. birthday. Happy oh, birthday. Thank you. So let's start. Well, let's go back to 1989. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> born and raised in, uh, in here in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Um, grew up in Brooklyn Park. Went to Channel Park High School and then actually ended up going to the University of Minnesota, where I graduated with a degree in strategic communications, advertising, and PR. Being involved in things kind of started when I was in high school. I played football. I, was, I started a student organization. I was in YMCA Black Achievers. I did a lot of different things after school. I played soccer. I was multi-sport athlete. And then when I got to college, I was involved in a lot of student organizations. So I'm used to doing a lot of things at one time, just staying busy as a kid. Um, I'm the oldest out of uh, three. I got a younger brother and younger sister. Um, and then my, both my parents are um, Cameroonian Im immigrants. So I'm a first generation American. So um, my family has a, a nice, rich culture. You know, got to be grow up in a lot of that um, here in Minnesota. And my dad actually, you know, he came to the United States over 45 years ago. And um, he was one of the first Cameroonians to settle in Minnesota. And so um, he's built his own community here of other Cameroonians that, which is a country in West Africa, West Central Africa. And yeah, so I have a lot of relatives and family that are here in Minnesota, so it's home. And uh, I guess professionally, after I graduated the University of Minnesota, um, I started doing like a lot of my like diversity and inclusion work through the Historical Society. I did a fellowship there, um, started my senior year of the, at the U, my, my last year at the U, and then going into like the first year out of college. And I did that. and. I got into tech at the same time when I started working part-time at Apple. Um, and I moved up in Apple pretty quickly. I kept getting promoted to different positions. I went to full-time and then went to the business side and started doing B2B sales. Then I, then I really fell in love. I always loved technology and I always loved history. And so I got to do a lot of those things at the same time. And then in 2016, while I was working at Apple, I um, met Alex at an event that we hosted at our store who's my co-founder for Gravity, and we started Gravity in 2016. And Gravity's focused on um, helping people of color break into the tech startup space here in the Twin Cities. Um, and so we wanted to see more founders of color being able to thrive um, here in the market, but it was hard because there wasn't a lot of resources or support for them, and they didn't see a lot of people that were that looked like them in, in spaces of like you know receiving money. And we know there's a lot of barriers and reasons for that that we wanted to talk about and expose um, and really help provide resources and inspiration to founders of color and, and other, anybody really who would just love to hear a great story and see people successful. And so we started doing events every month and that turned into us doing a summit every other year. And we got Arlen Hamilton out here for our first summit, who's a backstage, at least backstage capital. And um, she actually was unable to invest in one of um, the people that attended our our summit, which was Anila. I mean, um, yeah, Anila Kumar from uh, from Habit Aware, which is really cool. So, yeah, we've been able to do some really cool things with Gravity, and you know, our team has been is people people have come and gone, and we just had one team member got a job at Google, so she moved out west. We uh, we miss you, Bree, but <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Bree's uh, Bree's a, a friend of the podcast. She was. I know you guys know Bree. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she's uh, she's doing her thing out in uh, in Cali right now but she's still going to be very invested in what we're doing with gravity. So I'm excited about that. But, um, but yeah, so we, that was gravity. And then, um, 2017, um, I left Apple and I went to Mita and I started doing business consulting because, uh, my experience doing B2B sales and getting to work with startups, um, at, at through gravity kind of strove my passion to do consulting and work with businesses to help them grow. So at Mita, it's a nonprofit and, um, their goal is to help minority entrepreneurs succeed. Um, by providing technical assistance. So I did that 
um, for three years. And um, it was great. I got to work with a lot of people that I actually met through d doing gravity events that had only started as ideas that ended up like turning their ideas into businesses and then needed help. And I was able to help them through providing free consulting and access to opportunities and resources at Mita. You know, did a lot there. And while I was at Mita, I was able to use that experience to get on a couple of different boards. So I joined Transcend IT um, board um, in 2000, I think 18 or 19. And then um, Forge North, I'm on the leadership council for that. And I'm also on the Minnesota Black Chamber of Commerce board. And then I guess after most recently, in the middle of a pandemic, I decided it'd be a good idea to look at what, career, what a career change would be look like. <laughs> <laughs> so I saw an opportunity um, that I just couldn't pass up. And um, it's kind of really great timing to be in the space because for unfortunate reasons, but really looking at if you really want to see something change and being a part of it, working with the Center for Economic Inclusion is my new role as the Director of Employer Inclusivity. So I get to work with companies now to help them become more diverse and more inclusive and, and break down systemic racism and practices that are going on internally and provide opportunities for, for um, minority-owned businesses to, for supplier diversity opportunities, things like that. So the same businesses that I was able to consult with, I can provide larger opportunities now in my new capacity and my new role in the organization. So that's pretty cool. It's kind of like a nice um, next phase for me. Um, and, you know, like, like uh, I was talking with Jack, I'm still going to be doing, we're still going to be doing gravity stuff. Um, we're just trying to revamp exactly what that looks like. Um, looking to add more team members and, and to kind of re do a little bit of a refocus now that we've seen a lot of, with everything going on right now, especially with Minnesota being the epicenter for a lot of the movement and the, the, the tension that's going on in the country, we're seeing a lot of our companies talk about making investments to different communities of color. And I can address that personally in a, in a couple of different capacities through Forge North, through Gravity and through CEI. So I'm going to be very busy over the next couple of years. <laughs> but, yeah, um, I would say so. Yeah. That's a lot of, that's a lot of stuff going on in the, yeah. in the life of Sam. Yeah, it's pretty cool though. I mean, I mean, I, I, uh, I'm passionate about it, number one, and I think it's just the right thing to do at the right time. And, um, so yeah, I, I look forward to what those experiences look like and working with people to make change happen, especially here in Minnesota. So can you talk a little bit more about that decision to start Gravity? Mm -hmm. And um, you know, a lot of people might see, oh, this could be better or this is a problem, but then yeah. don't necessarily do anything about it. And you, right. you and Alex and the whole Gravity team have you know, done something pretty pretty substantial. I yeah. was at that first summit that you referenced with Arlo. That was a great event. And, you know, it's, it, it, it sounds like this is just kind of the person you are, like impact a problem. Don't just complain about it or observe the problem. Yeah. But those early days of gravity, what was the, like the specific thing you were trying to solve? And do you think you have made progress? I think the fact that gravity exists, you've made progress, but is the problem any smaller than when you, when you yeah. started? That's a great question. So, so I have a friend, Leslie uh, Redmond, she's the president of the NAACP. One of the, her quotes that she likes to say a lot is don't complain, activate. And I've always stood by that. Even before I met her, that's how my mindset was, right? Like, I don't, I don't like complaining about things and then not being able to do anything about it. And so when we, when Alex and I met and we just had a conversation, he kind of said, you know, his, he shared his experience in the startup world and, and going to events and what that was like. And I was just slowly kind of going into the startup world um, because I had people that I was working with at Apple who were starting businesses. And it was really fascinating just hearing all of that. Um, and I wanted to see what it would look like to get into that. I was thinking, you know, maybe I'll work for a startup one of these days. Some of these clients that I'm working with are growing. They're buying all these Apple products. Oh, I love to work there. It's a cool company, right? What would that experience be like? And so we started Gravity really just because there was when i looked around and i started seeing people who i knew like were developers and had ideas for apps and um i was getting to know about some of the tech events that were going on but they didn't know about it and i'm like well why don't you guys know about it like what's going on or they've had they've gone and they didn't feel welcomed or or it wasn't a lot of people that looked like them there and um so it was just like challenging to kind of feel comfortable and a lot of people that are in tech are introverted you know so it's like it's already hard going to an event <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah. let alone you know being 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 the only one of somebody that's there right um so we just wanted to create a space really that's really all it was is just an opportunity for people to connect and, and and network and then also talk about issues right and so well one of the things that we did early on that i love that we do is our fireside chat series so like we would find a founder who is raising money and and or who has started bootstrapping and just like really in the early stage of what that journey was like and they just shared it you know and bootstrapping means different things to different people right one of the things we talked about in one of our bootstrapping um, workshops that we had is just, you know, when you talk about bootstrapping, it's like you, some people start a company after maybe working at a Fortune 500 company or a corporate America for a while, right? And then they, they say, okay, well, they make good money. They can live on their own or they got, they're married. They have a spouse that is able to support them while they're following their dream or they may come from a family that has money. Um, that is not the case for a lot of founders of color, right? Where they have the resources and, and the generational wealth to pass along that will allow them to support themselves while they're going through something. A lot of founders that we worked with were actually working their full-time job while trying to grow their company at the same time. Um, perfect example was um, my guy, James, who had um, Spark DJ. He was one of our earlier fireside chats and he was working at Target when he started the idea and had to like really be careful about how he grew his business until he was ready and comfortable to go. And even when he was ready to go, it still was a leap. You know what I'm saying? He still had his struggles that he went through, um, but he was able to get into some accelerator programs that helped him kind of like go through and, and get some really good support around the way, but not everybody has that opportunity, right? And some people don't even know about these programs. They don't even know about these accelerator programs. So what we were trying to do is disconnect, you know, people who are starting early on starting businesses to some of these opportunities that were around. Then they started reaching out to us. Alex was actually in one of those programs. He was in the Google 2040 um, Entrepreneur Residence Program when we first started Gravity. So he had a really great network of, of Google resources and, um, and resources through Coco with co-working spaces. So we, would, uh, we did a lot of our events out of Coco, which is now Fuel Collective early on. And they provided the space for us to be able to have those conversations and highlight those founders. And, um, and then we started, started seeing more and more people coming. And Gravity's events are not exclusive to anybody. It's open to anybody that wants to come in and just hear a different perspective. And that's really what we wanted to provide because we didn't see that happening at a lot of the other events. Or if we did, it was a lot of just the same faces um, that were representing a whole group of people. And we wanted to say, okay, well, you may not be known right now, but you're going to get known because you spoke at our event and we're going to like, make sure people understand how they can support you and what you're doing with your business or your app or your whatever you've got going on. So describe the events a little bit for those that are listening to this and thinking like, yeah, cool. I, I'm in, I want to get involved. Like what's the typical turnout? What's the typical format? You mentioned the fireside chats, but I know that's yeah. not exclusively the thing. And you know, probably obviously have these pivoted to online things in a, you know, a right. pandemic world. How's, how's that going? And is that, has that been, constraint for gravity or is that actually bringing more people to the table potentially yeah so so we haven't so for 2020 because it's been such a weird year and everything has been going on with everybody we haven't done much events in 2020 yet we are planning on second half of 2020 getting back to doing events probably going to continue doing things virtually like everybody else um and we're going to do more of like an interview style thing kind of like this format where we'll have zoom and by facebook live and um, catch up with some of the people that we've we've talked to in the past to see how they've navigated um, dealing with COVID and having a startup and just kind of getting those stories told. Um, you know how what's it like fundraising and during a pandemic. You know things like that is what we want to kind of highlight. But you know prior to COVID happening, you know we would have our fireside chat series. We did a really 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 greatly attended and and streamed event we did we do a lot of our events on facebook live too even if they're live in person we'll still stream it online so people can see it um and we had an event last year that we still people still talk to me about is our nine to five versus the side hustle event so we had a panel of people that had um full-time jobs at corporate companies and then people that had side hustles um and that were transitioning into becoming full-time entrepreneurs and just having that conversation and then how like 
the stigma behind like having a side hustle or having a being an entrepreneur and then, or working a corporate job and working for the man, all those different things that, <laughs> you know, people talk about and how the perceptions that we have about each other and like, you know, having that conversation, I think was really fun and rich. And, um, you know, we got really great feedback from that. We want to bring that back again. Um, hopefully when we can be around people again, cause that was really fun. But, um, that was hosted at Lunar Startups over in St. Paul. We do, we've been doing a lot of our events later, um, most recently over there. Um, they've been a great partner of ours as well, too. And then our summit, which we had in November, was hosted at Target Commons. And Target's been a sponsor of ours for a quite, a, quite a, pretty much all of Gravity's existence. So we um, were able to bring in some really great uh, speakers and, 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 and key- keynote speakers and talk about um, things all the way, things from like um, accessibility, I- inclusivity from like people with disabilities and tech. And we had um, Bello Kipriani, who was one of my clients at Mita. He gave a great presentation on that. We had Lewis from Media Garcia talk about um, scaling your business with, you know, digital um, aggregation and whatnot. And um, we had a, my, actually my boss now, Tawana Black, spoke at our summit and she led a panel on social impact companies. So like, we had um, Muhammad from Epimonia and Isaiah from Money Verbs and um, Nestor from Liddy Solar. They all spoke about their their different um, businesses and, and why they started them and, and the social aspect behind starting their businesses, trying to solve a problem. Um, and these are all founders of color that are doing great work. So just really providing that platform is really what the whole purpose and goal is for that. Um, and just finding different and unique ways to do it. Um, one other thing that we did that was different, we did, uh, we partnered with St. Paul Neighborhood, I think St. Paul Neighborhood Network, at SPNN, um, and we did uh, an event called Gravity Live, which was like a live recording of a show. It was like a pilot almost that we shot, and it was like, that was in, that was last year with uh, D- Darren from, uh, from Asdell, and he, um, I worked with him at Media as well too, and talked about him and his journey and his company, and um, he's been doing some great work, so just different things like that. Those are the type of things that we're open to doing and um, want to do more of once we kind of kind of get things back rolling again. Mm-hmm. But we're, right now we're just taking the time being four years in um, and having some turnover with our team, just kind of reevaluating exactly where we're at, what we want to do, what we have the capacity to do. You know what I'm saying? Because everybody individually is busy. Like gravity is not our full time thing. It's like what we all do on the side because we're passionate about it. But mm-hmm. we, we know that it's important and we want to continue to provide that that experience to our, our ecosystem. Yeah. Well, for listeners who maybe don't even or want to attend event, but then maybe have some capacity, we'll make sure to link up in the show notes, how to get in touch with you and gravity, just provide help. Cause I think it's, I think it's great work. Let's talk about the new gig. So, yeah. you know, day two in the new job, from what <laughs> I understand, tell people that don't know what is the center for economic inclusion you know, the work they do. And then let, let's kind of talk about how you kind of, you know, met Tawana and, and how, how, how she convinced you to kind of come over and, and get involved. Yeah. So, so actually a really funny story. Well, maybe not that funny. It's just it's kind of ironic, <laughs> but, <laughs> but so how, so I met Tawana, I've met Tawana in passing a couple of times prior to her speaking, me reaching out and wanting her to moderate our panel at my summit um, last fall. And Oh, we had a really great experience. She really loved it and was really impressed with like what we're doing and the work we're doing with, uh, with uh, gravity. And so um, I actually was asked to speak at her summit, which is supposed to be in April. And I was one of the keynotes for that talking about the work I do with gravity there. Um, and that because of COVID, it got pushed to December. So right while we were like, you know, everything was going on. I just saw the, I saw that they were expanding and they got some, some job opportunities coming up. And I was like, I looked at the job description for what I'm doing now. And I was like, huh, this seems like a really great opportunity. I'm just going to go ahead and just apply just to see what happens. And um, when I got the call back and we just talked about it, it was, it started to make more sense as far as like what I would be doing and um, the opportunity that was, that was there. And I was like, I need to go for it. So I decided just to continue with the interview process and um, it, it really just started, everything started clicking and falling in place. And then like really what the center does is it, it's an organization that's, that was founded right around the time Gravity was founded actually. It's, they're not, it's, not that, it's not that old of an organization, it's still very new, but 
they're in their starter phase. Now we're kind of going into scaling up and we're hiring some more positions like myself and a couple of people are getting hired at the same time. And um, really we're focused on trying to create a more inclusive economy for our region. Um, and we're doing that in a bunch of different ways. Um, but we're focusing on, um, you know, you know, human capital, economic um, development, transit, um, housing. This is a whole gambit of different aspects of where we feel like if we can improve these things, we can solve like a lot of the racial disparities that Minnesota sees. Um, because, you know, I don't know if, if, if for the listeners who may not be aware, while, you know, Minnesota is very great for a lot of things. And, and but when it comes to, when you break it down between um, whites and blacks in Minnesota, we are rank at the bottom when it comes to housing, education, um, and employment. So these are areas that um, that affect like a lot of other aspects. If it comes to um, when you look at different communities that have been disenfranchised over the years, that increases crime in those those specific communities. And then you see um, the the over the over presence of policing and things like that. And that is where you get situations like we saw with George Floyd. And so we feel that if we can help improve these other areas, some of those things will solve themselves when people are in a much better environment. And then also from a standpoint, from an economic standpoint, because I think that when you look at the whole topic of racism, it's tied to economics because the country was built on capitalism and slavery, right? So Mm -hmm. if you can affect like, you look at how these these systems have been put in place even after slavery was abolished, it's still to able to protect um, companies who have been making money off of labor for cheap. Um, there's, that's still happening today, right? You look at the, the, the private prisons that are out there. You look at companies that use private, private, prison, labor, private, private prison labor for um, to be able to make their products. All of those things are tied into the problems that we're seeing right now in the streets, right? And why people are protesting. So it's just about helping people understand that and then looking at these companies who are really, some of these companies and people that work there, they genuinely wanna be able to help and solve the problem. Um, but understanding exactly like the system that has been created that helped them become profitable, the, pro- the, the flaws that, that, had, that are in there that prevent true change from happening for specific communities is really the work that I'm gonna be focusing on now. Um, and helping tell that story, you know, control that narrative and make sure that, you know, there's clear cut solutions to how we can solve these problems. Because one of the things that we that that they believe at the center is that if the economy is more cl- inclusive and everybody's going to win, these businesses are going to win. Um, you're going to have more people that are able to become consumers. Um, you're going to be able to your companies internally are going to be able to um, re- maintain and retain talent better. Um, if they're creating a more inclusive culture and environment. Um, so all these things tie into each other. Um, mm-hmm. And it's not even about, you know, what political side you may be on. It's more so about how do you value human life, right, at the end of the day. And that's just really what drew me to the opportunity to work there um, and to do what I'm doing specifically, which is working hand in hand with these companies as the director of employee inclusivity and providing best practices and helping them um, understand some of the ways that they can be the best version of themselves. And so do those companies hire you to help them evolve and get better? Um, yeah, that's, that, that is, that is uh, what we're going to be focusing on. So my job is to help build a team that we can work with companies to, um, to, to hire our team to be able to help them implement some of these best practices. So, yeah. That was going to be my question too. And you probably don't know this answer yet, but has there been an increase of companies reaching out in the last month? Oh yeah. Yeah, there has, there has. And I, I, I mean, I, it's today's it's day two. I don't know who they are. I just got there, but I already know like the opportunity is definitely there. Um, and you know, Minnesota is a unique place because we have so many companies that are headquartered here that really people look to and, and, you know, we, we, we're looking forward to working with companies who really truly want to make change. That's really what we're focusing on right now. And, um, you know, anybody that wants to join that work is willing, you know, we have, we have jobs open right now. So I'll say that. <laughs> <laughs> get the link involved. to those in the show notes. Right. <laughs> Activate and get paid to do so. Exactly. Exactly. Um, so Sam, how do you, how do you juggle all this stuff? 
you know, you're not the first person on the podcast who's like, oh, I do this and I do this and I've got this thing and I do that thing. It's a lot, a lot on your plate. How do you think about like balancing downtime and just, you know, Sam doing fun Sam things yeah. versus all of the commitments that you have to you know, other people and other things? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's definitely not easy, but I think one of the things that I've tried to learn over the years is don't overcommit to a lot of things you don't like to do just because you have to do them. Like try and do I, everything I'm involved in right now is something that I'm passionate about and it kind of feeds into the other thing. So it makes, so a lot of this stuff makes my actual job a lot easier because I'm involved in them. Mm-hmm. So like I already, I'm able to build relationships that allow me to, because at the end of the day, when you talk about business, a lot of part, a lot of business and just the whole corporate world is about relationships that you have. And I've been able to do that with all the things that I've been involved in and that experience that I've been able to create for myself or, or opportunities that I've been blessed with. Um, being able to just show up, be present and then be engaged has really helped me learn a lot, number one, but then also just build relationships with people that, that present other opportunities, right? Because I did Gravity and I was able to put a summit together, that's how I was able to get engaged with Tawana and then now I'm working with her, you know? So there's a lot of things that, have happened for me because of me just being involved and being present and being engaged while I'm there. Um, it's not even just about showing up, it's about how you show up, right? Um, and I don't wanna like do anything that I'm not able to do and actually um, contribute positively towards, otherwise it just defeats the purpose, right? Um, so, and, and again, I'm not perfect by any means. I'm still kind of trying to figure it all out, but I also surround myself around people that hold me accountable and challenge me to make sure that I'm doing what I need to be doing. So that helps too. And then yeah. when I, when then when I want to have fun, I just have fun. <laughs> you know, like I like to, I like to travel. I like to listen to music and watch TV shows. Um, I finished all of Ozark while I was on quarantine and that was amazing. Um, <laughs> no spoilers. <laughs> so yeah, <laughs> so it's been good, but, um, but no, I, I, I just, I think that it's important to, um, like I said, like if I see a problem, I want to be involved in the solution too. So like, I just can't fight doing that, but I have to learn, I'm learning to balance myself a little bit more. And, and, and when I'm not working, just stop working. Right. Especially being at home teaches you how, that you have to have that balance. So this year has been really, really good for that because now that I don't have to like physically go everywhere to everybody's events, it's just right. a matter of me <laughs> going on a Zoom and, <laughs> and like, or be taking a phone call. But then like, if I don't want to pick up the phone, I don't have to, right? Um, and I'll just say, hey, I'm not talking. I'm not taking calls after this time, and everything's good. So, you kind of joked about switching jobs during a you know pandemic and economic crisis. Did um, did you did you hesitate? to do so just because yeah everything's so unstable like having your job turned upside down just creates more instability and curious what what it's like to onboard with a company when you can't show up someplace i mean our company's remote so i kind of know how but you know you're onboarding to a company that's not used to working remotely how's that gone for you right it's actually been going pretty smooth um you know i did the whole interview process remotely so it was like you know zoom has been really essential so shout out to zoom for getting their stuff together um i know it was a little rough in the beginning but (laughs) i didn't didn't have any issues while i was going through my interview process and um (laughs) so now it's like you know we we, you know we just have meetings as a team and then i doing one-on-ones and kind of just like um i've been i'm working with another one of my other coworkers, chris he just kind of came on with me a couple weeks ago so he's a little bit older than me in cei age but um we're going through our onboarding process together so that's been pretty cool too and um, and then I guess, you know, it was hard actually leaving me because, you know, um, I work with, you know, clients that, you know, need support, need resources. And I, you know, had really great relationships with my clients and I'm going to miss working with them in that capacity. But um, I know that, you know, they're going to be taken care of and it's just going to be a little bit of a transition. But, you know, that I just want to make sure that, you know, at the end of the day, I left them in a good place. Right. Um and so that was a challenge and that was where some hesitation came in. But then I looked at the opportunity and I looked at what it meant for me personally and like, you know, the life I want to build for myself. And I was like, I need to at least go for it. Right. And I just kind of let the rest in God's hands. And, you know, I was presented with the opportunity and, and I was able to, to move forward. So that was a blessing in itself. So if somebody's listening and they are appropriately thinking, 
you know, even even a company doing well with diversity, equity, and inclusion can be doing better. Mm -hmm. If somebody's thinking that that applies to them, which should be most of the world, what is the you know profile of a company where it's a good fit to engage with you and your team? And how does that? I recognizing your two days on the job. So <laughs> speaking to Ms. Tawana Black, like we don't expect <laughs> Sam to be an expert. How does somebody get plugged in and what does that sort of engagement look like? Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, you can, the first thing is I would just advise them to um, visit our website. So the Center for Economic Inclusion org. Um, and we also, if, if you're really early on, you want to kind of get into like what the work looks like. Um, we do a speaker series that we're going to be unveiling here shortly. And then also the summit that we host every year, it's an annual summit. It's a great way to get engaged with like the work of the center and hear from other um, em employers and people in different at different companies and um, about like experiences that you may not be familiar with and, and really get, and really just come and learn first and then do a self-evaluation of where you're at as a company um, and then reach out to us and we can do an assessment. That's what I would say at this point, that we do two days on the job. Um, <laughs> would, That's would, pretty would, good. You <laughs> know, what I would suggest people doing because right now I think it's like, you know, every, I think there, there is a, there is a, um, there's, there's a super genuine aspect of people wanting to be better at diversity and inclusion. And then there's a PR aspect of it. Right. And so it's like, you know, everybody else is doing it. So we got to do it too. There's that. There is that, but there's also this, that genuine, like we need to be better because we have not been good enough. And so a lot of that first comes from self-reflection, like really understanding like where you are, like look at your leadership team, like who is, who's making decisions for your organization? Like, is it coming from a diverse lens? Is it, and if it's not, why, right? Asking yourself those hard questions and really saying we can be a lot better. And then really looking at who you have on, on any, any level lower and saying, okay, some of these, some, some people may not be ready right now, but who can we either elevate internally or how can we be more intentional, intentional about how we're recruiting to get more diverse perspectives on our leadership team? Because that's where it starts. It's a top-down approach. Um, because at the end of the day, you know, you can hire a bunch of people um, from different backgrounds, but if they're not seeing people that reflect them in leadership, it's going to be very hard for them to feel like they have an opportunity to get into leadership at a point in time, right? So, um, like, really doing that work is going to be essential and really being, really seeing true change. Because if if you are trying to dance around that piece, then it's, you're going to you're going to end up in the same spot sooner or later, and spend a lot of money trying to figure out, <laughs> you know, what I'm saying a solution where it's like it starts from the top that's my mm -hmm. that's my personal opinion that's not anything that the center says it's just like what my perspective on the situation um but i would like to bring that perspective as i do the work well, i wonder if there's an opportunity for the center broadly and for you personally to take some of those people on the pr track and move them to like sincere engagement <laughs> and realizing this is you no know, the, the, the pr is going to fade you right. know um and the people that aren't in it for the right reasons, you know, perhaps you can pull them, pull them to the other, the other side. Yeah. That, that, that's the hope. And I think that, you know, it's going to, but it, I think sometimes, sometimes the part, the, the part of that's really hard is, you know, especially me being somebody that represents a, a, a marginalized community. Right. Um, it's hard to always be, the voice that tries to convince a majority community about the challenges and problems that are going on, it's going to take internally. So like people on that team are going to have to speak up and say the uncomfortable thing mm -hmm. uh, to really see change happen. And if anybody's listening to this, like that's what I would you know, challenge you to do is like really like speak up about it and actually say something and ask the question, like, why haven't we made a statement or why haven't we, or well, we made a statement, but what are we really going to be doing? And like, Who's going to like, how are we really going to engage with these communities when nobody in our company is from there? Like, how do we focus on getting more people into this space? Right. Like, those are the type of things that you want to start to do to really say, OK, I'm making a true difference. Right. Um, because I think we've seen incidents happen before in the past where companies have made statements um, and they turn around, and do the same practices and, um, and they, or they don't hire <laughs> the people that they say they want to hire for whatever reason. And so like, I think 
now what's happening now, which is different than a lot of other times any of this has happened is, I think a lot of people are seeing it for what it is for the first time. You know what I'm saying? Especially the way George Floyd's murder happened and how public it was. Mm -hmm. um, it was like, wow, it was really eye opening for a lot of people. And it, re it reignited a lot of people's passion for fighting for ju social justice. And so we see a lot of people out protesting that are from way different backgrounds and like work at some of these companies, you know what I'm saying? Like that are out in the street because they're on, they're on, they're working from home so they can go to the protest if they want to, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So everybody's just like able to do it. And it's good that people are showing up, but I think we need to channel that energy and like make true change. Like, you know, by getting involved in, in your local, local politics and, and then also like look and understanding what policies are set up and how they're set up in your companies. Right. And asking those questions of why, is this the case? Um, it may not be uncomfortable. Some people may lose their job, but at least if you really want to feel like you did something impactful, like that's where it starts. And mm -hmm. yeah, so. <laughs> well, thank you for saying that. I think a lot of times people, they don't know what to do and they are looking for someone to tell them what to do. Mm -hmm. And so just hearing that I think is inspiring and helpful. Yeah, I, I, I think it's, um, and it's okay because to be honest, like there is, you know, there's no matter, so depending on who you are, you may have a completely different life experience for a number of different reasons. And I think a lot of it is like, we surround ourselves around people that are similar to us, right? Cause it's the most comfortable thing to do. Um, I don't, I try and I have a lot of friends from different backgrounds and that, that help me see things from different perspectives. And I think for me growing up as a first generation, like, um, American with like my parents having like a whole different experience growing up and me having one here in America like helps me see things from different lenses and perspectives so um, I have that ability but not everybody has that experience and I have to recognize that so I can't hold people to like my standard of like how I live my life but understand where people are at and meet them where they're at um, but still holding them accountable when they say they want to do good and be better like okay what are you doing about it like mm. you know we don't learn about a lot of these things and when we're in high school we, by design right and so it's like we go to college we may meet people that we never would have met before but how deep are those friendships and how you can still keep in contact with those people and then if you go back to your bubble after you graduate and you live in like a community that was similar to the one you grew up where it's not diverse then you're not going to be around issues or see things from somebody else's perspective because you're not going to have those personal relationships with people that you could if you did challenge yourself and surround yourself around other types of people, right? So I think that that's just what creates like that, you know, that, that, that willful ignorance type of thing, right? Where it's like, okay, well, I don't see it. Well, you, just because you don't see it doesn't mean it's not there. Like mm -hmm. as a man, I don't see a lot of things women go through. It doesn't mean that they don't go through. So it's like, just because you grew up differently doesn't mean that um, I don't experience issues with the police when, it, when I do, right? So just really understanding it that way, that's how, that's how I try and break it down. Um, and, and yeah, it's been, I've had some really good conversations with, with people that I've known for a long time and they're learning and it's good. <laughs> that's good to hear. What is next for you? I, I, I like to ask people, what do you like, what do you want to be when you grow up? Mm -hmm. And I know you just started a new job, so maybe it's tough to look yeah. past that, but do you know kind of where you want to be eventually? Yeah, I guess what's next for me is just day three of my new job. To yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Appropriate um, answer. No, right, right. So, um, but no, I think that, I guess that's a really interesting question. I mean, I, I, I survived the whole year in my 30s. So like, I'm now 31. So it's like, okay, I would ask myself like what I wanted to be when I was in my 30s, like a couple years ago. And like, you know, you always thought you would be like in a different place. But I mean, I think I'm, I'm doing, I'm, I'm very blessed to be where I'm at right now. I think I'm just trying to like, this, this whole change is kind of like new. So I'm like trying to take it all in and even remember like when I wake up, like my whole, my role title, all that's different. So I'm just, I'm really, I'm really in that moment of trying to like get used to like my new life. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess in like, I guess in like five years, you know, um, just want to can you know I want to at least be able to say that my my work at the center was transformational in making like gains in in in, in you know racially racial equality here in Minnesota um and like and also like saying that you know whatever we what we experienced here on May 25th 
when George Floyd was murdered and all of the people that I know that are doing work on the ground, um, people that haven't gotten sleep, that have been protecting businesses and, and dealing with a lot of like crazy things, um, that all the sacrifice that they made like paid off in like a couple of years, right? And we start seeing things um, a lot better for a lot of people. And Minnesota actually turns it around and we're not the worst at social and racial um, um, disparities anymore. You know, we've made progress, right? And we've created innovation that a lot of other states want to follow and use. That's what I hope to be a part of. If it's my work through the center, if it's through gravity, so be it. It doesn't really matter, but I just want to be a part of that. You know, that's that's really what I look forward to. And I think it just working, my role now gives me more of an opportunity to play in part of that solution than I had before, right? Because as a business consultant, I'm, I'm, I'm helping businesses be successful, but I'm, they're still navigating a, a system that wasn't designed for them to be successful, right? Because mm -hmm. I'm working specifically with entrepreneurs of color and it's like, there's a bunch of things that they go through. And so how do I help change the system? This is really where I think my job at CEI is gonna allow me to do that. Well, we are almost at time here, but we have two more questions that we ask everybody. The first being, who is somebody in Minnesota Tech that we should know about and why? Mm. Great question. So many Minnesota tech you should know about. So a couple of people, I'll just name some of my clients that I work with um, at Mita and that I've known through Gravity. So Silas Wellington, he's the founder of Upscriber. Um, he has a really cool um, service that he's created that allows businesses to create their own personal subscriptions for their customers. Um, so um, if you have like a, you know, a beauty salon or a small coffee shop and you want to create a subscription for a customer. He created an entire marketplace and platform where you can find subscriptions you can buy. And then you can also like create one as a business and provide it to your customers. So that way you, those businesses can get residual income um, and generate some money that way um, and market their services. So um, Silas is one you should know. Mike Jackson has a, has a, a company called um, the premium app and he does, he's an event, a management tool that he created for event planners and then also a place where consumers can go and see some of the, the, the nice local events that they got going on. And then um, Isaiah Goodman with Money Verbs, he's, uh, he's a financial advisor. He has a company called Becoming Financial, um, but he um, has created Money Verbs as a way to teach financial literacy to youth and um, people in communities that um, that have not had that information. So he created an entire app and a platform for that. Um, and then um, I mentioned Darren earlier from Asdell. He created a marketplace for um, brands who are, who are um, selling on Amazon um, to be able to manage their sales and, and analytics and all of that through, through his platform, uh, Grit, which is um, live now. So, and we've seen how important that is with COVID happening. Amazon is the first trillion dollar, well, not the first thing, Apple was the first trillion, but Jeff Bezos is the first trillionaire or whatever. He's just making a lot of money. So like, <laughs> <laughs> you know, Amazon's hot right now. So if, you're, if you are selling on Amazon and you have any brands that you know, um, definitely check out Asdell. And then um, I want to say, especially right now, it, I know a lot of people already know her, but right now her work is super important. Caroline. Karanja from 26 Letters. Um, she created a platform to help organizations with um, diversity and inclusion and, um, and racial bias. So I would definitely reach out to her. I know I'm gonna be working with her at my, in my, new, my new capacity because she's good at what she does. Wow, that's a fantastic list and some folks that I hadn't heard of yet. So thank you for that. And I think our listeners will appreciate that. I am going to ask you two more questions and sure. disrupt the flow. What's something about Cameroonian culture that's really cool that most people don't know? Mm, that's a great question. So the food is amazing. And I'm not just saying that because like that's your mom's cooking. Mom. Yeah. <laughs> my mom's a great cook. Okay. Yeah. Any of my friends know it. My girlfriend knows <laughs> it. Like she's an amazing cook. Um, but the, the food is really good. It's really rich. Um, actually, the word Cameroon is actually, um, so our biggest export is shrimp. Because Cameroon and Cameroon in French, it's, I think it is, it's, it's shrimp. It's the shrimp or river or something like that. I forgot what the name of it is. I have it right up here. But um, but yeah, so we have a lot of, we eat a lot of seafood, fish, shrimp, and all that stuff. But, um, and then we, 
so music is very popular as well too. Um, we we actually created a genre of music called Makosa, which is used in a lot of like current Afrobeats music now. Um, Michael Jackson used that in a lot of his music as well too. And he actually traveled to Cameroon. There's actually a, a picture of him. I think it's him and Spike Lee and he's wearing a Cameroonian shirt with a Cameroonian flag on it. It's pretty cool. But, um, but yeah, so um, the food and the, the music is really rich. And then um, we've produced some of the best soccer players that come out of West Africa. So Yeah, <laughs> I did know that part. Yeah. Um, <laughs> if you watch yeah. English Premier League, you saw, probably have seen Samuel Eto'o. And, um, and yeah, and so like there's, you know, there's, there's a list. There's a, there's a great list of soccer players that come out. Um, and it's just, you know, it's a great culture very family fun centric. Um, it's a dual lingual country. So there's, there's a French speaking side and there's an English speaking side and my family's from the English speaking side. Mm -hmm. So, um, but I do have family that speak French and, and all that too. So. Cool. Well, thank you. Um, so final thing as we bring it in for landing, as Jack said, um, what's something you love about Minnesota outside of business? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so, Number one of the big things I love about Minnesota is sadly, you cannot experience it at the State Fair. Um, <laughs> I'm going to miss that dearly. And I'm sorry to bring it up. I know it's getting closer to the date and ah, I'm gonna miss it so much. But I, I can scab love, for a lot of listeners, I'm sure. I know, I know. I'm, I'm in pain with you, so don't be upset. But State Fair and then I'm a huge, I love that growing up, like being a sports fan and playing sports growing up, like we have all the, the major sports teams here. Um, and, you know, we, we, we go through our struggles, but to be a Minnesota sports fan, you have to be dedicated. And so I think, I think being a Minnesota sports fan has allowed me to maintain loyal, lo le learn true loyalty, right? And commitment <laughs> and dedication. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so yeah, it's, that's been fun. <laughs> yeah. I like that answer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, well, Sam, this has been a pleasure. Um, you know, thank you for all the amazing work that you're doing and for being a positive, uh, you know, source of change in the community. Um, I, I really enjoyed talking with you and having you on the podcast. So thank you so much for your time. Kevin, I appreciate it. Jack, thank you so much. I know we were talking about getting me on this thing for a while and then, you know, situation. You're busy guy. <laughs> busy guy. That's okay. Right. right. <laughs> <laughs> we're playing a long game here, Sam. You know, we got, right. we got plenty of time. Uh, so... <laughs> But I'm glad we made it happen. And for people that want to connect with you, um, we'll put the, the links to the, the center and gravity. If somebody just wants to like connect with Sam, what's the, what's the best way for people to, to find you on the socials? Yeah, so you can reach out to me if it's gravity related, sam at gravity.com. If it's uh, center related, it's S and then my last name, Delhi, uh, N D E L Y, at center for economic inclusion.org. And then I'm on LinkedIn um, and I'm on Facebook. And, and and Twitter and all the other social media platforms as well too. Post a lot of great content and information and try and keep people informed. And I'm a huge Minnesota sports fan, so you'll see a lot of that too. So nice, nice. On LinkedIn is probably if you want from a business standpoint, um, that's probably the best place to to get in touch with me and see what I'm up to and some of the things that I'm working on and talking about. Cool. Well, thank you again, Sam. It's been a pleasure. All right. Thank you so much. You guys have a great evening. Thank you. See you. Thanks for listening to the Tech.MN podcast. If you like what you just heard, we'll hope you'll share the love by giving us a five-star review wherever you listen to podcasts. You can find us at Tech.MN or on Twitter at TechDotMN.